Hey, photographers. Trigger alert. If you think you know which brand has the best autofocus, you may be surprised. <laughs> Today, I'm going to demonstrate some of the advanced features of the Fujifilm X-H2 to see how it performs. For my features and functions review, there's a link in the description below. And I've also posted a video showing you how I recommend you configure this camera. But today, I'm going through features like burst mode, including continuous autofocus, and pixel shift, complete contents, and links to the various sections in the description. Let's start with autofocus. Single, the smallest single point, 425 points. Now, you see how much of the frame those 425 points cover. Uh, this is the XF16-55 to lens at 55mm, making a point of that because I've noticed that not all lenses are as fast. I found the new 56mm f1.2 to be particularly slow. Each of these demos starts at infinity with the subject near the closest focus distance. Here's in the center. Let's also try the edges and the corners. Now with face and eye detect. John asked how well that works with the digital zoom. I'm happy to report that it works just fine. Even eye detect works on my tiny Brio figure. Let's turn down the lights and make sure that performance doesn't change. Nice. Now, for Burst, I'm using a freshly formatted 128 gig CF Express B card, rated for 1200 megabytes per second writing speed. And I've set exposure, focus, and white balance to manual, stabilization off, boost on, so the camera has nothing else to think about. The EVF frame rate is at 240 for zoom through motion. I'm just recording fine JPEGs. Using the electronic shutter, I'm starting with the fastest, 20 frames. That's a crop of 1.29, and the resulting images will be 24 megapixels. With an external monitor connected, there's no shutter sound effect. 128 gigs can store 8,762 shots. Now, in the first five seconds, exactly 100 frames. And after 60 seconds, a total of 1,200. While recording, and for a second or two after, the disk activity light is red and flashing red and green, and it stays green for a long time. I waited over eight minutes before it went out. Now, if you turn the camera off before it's done, all the images are on the card, but then it lights up when the camera's turned on again until it's finished doing something. Still in electronic, I went down to 15 frames, which is actually 13, now at 40 megapixels. Again, results exactly as promised. 65 images in 5 seconds, but after 60 seconds, 18 more than the 780 I expected. I changed to the mechanical shutter for true 15 frames. The expected 75 images in 5 seconds, and now, after 60 seconds, 19 frames over the expected 900. Amazing. Amazing enough to see what would happen if I added raw, lossless compressed. But I reformatted first. That takes the 128 gig down to just over 1800 frames. That's 20 seconds of 15 frame shooting. 77 frames in the first 5 seconds, but after 7 seconds, the stuttering starts, slowing to 7 per second. After 30 seconds, 271 images. Then, with RAW only, 76 frames in the first five, stuttering starts at 14 seconds after capturing 213 images. It continues taking about 7 per second. After 30 seconds, 329 RAW files, and those are excellent results. One more thing worth testing is the pre-shot. I soft press the shutter at 5 seconds, then full press at 10. Hard to tell exactly when it switches over, but I think about 13 frames saved from before 10 seconds. Of course, a long-lasting fast burst isn't worth much if focus doesn't keep up. Back to electronic, 20 frames with the crop and my Brio train, boost is on, 
continuous with wide tracking mode using the XF16-55 to lens f3.2 and the train gets to the lens's closest focus point. For stills, soft press when the object arrives in the scene. Impressive, as it locks on, stays focused through the change of side to the very edge of the frame and all the way in to the closest focus point. Let's press the shutter all the way. It looks good while shooting, but the proof is in the images, which amazed me. The hundred images taken in the five seconds for the train to come around to the closest point are all in focus. Yes, you heard that right. They are all in focus. That's something I've never seen. Now, admittedly, the camera isn't moving, and to be honest, it's not completely foolproof. There's a learning curve to setting the capture point and getting the whole process right. And how about that subject detection train setting? Well, the focus rectangle does seem to recognize it, but then it focuses on the train instead of the engineer, which wasn't helpful for this scene. <laughs> I'd love to spend more time on this, but the camera has to go to another creator. Dinner in a wine cellar seemed to be a good opportunity to test high ISOs, uh, starting with 3200. Going in for detail at the top of the image, this is one image pixel to one 4K video pixel. A good definition, very little grain, accurate color. At 6400, a little softer, some noise in the darkest areas, still pretty acceptable. And then up to 12.8, smudging in the shadows, more noise, but no color deterioration or shift. Then the extended, 25.6, there's modeling in the shadows with some color noise. And at the max, 51.2, uh, there's pretty clear loss of definition accompanied by lots of noise. Those feel like pretty good results for a packed APS-C sensor, though. So, for the next section about video, it helps if you know that this video was output at 4K 16 by 9 using ProRes 422 Profile using Final Cut's 10-bit output setting. I'm not sure what processing YouTube has applied. The video samples are all shot with sunlight white balance, a turn of film sim, shutter speed 60, using a ND.9 three-stop filter. I have the histogram and highlight alert on, and I'm keeping the ISO as low as I can, primarily adjusting the aperture for exposure. Data levels are set for video. On a tripod, stabilization off. I'm starting with 4K HQ 16x9 to go through some of the codecs. First, H.264, all intra, 8 bit, 420, at its max, 360 megabits. Uh, in the bottom left, the space remaining on the 128 gig card, but I'm recording as I go. You'll see remaining time, I'll tell you the max. Here it's 46 minutes. Going up to H.265, all intra 10 bit 420, with its max 720 megabits, 23 minutes. Then H.265422, the same. ProRes HQ, also 10 bit, data rate can't be set, but down to 16 minutes. ProRes 422, 24 minutes. And ProRes LT, 34 minutes. So of those, I've chosen ProRes 422 as my default, and changing to 6.2K lowers the time to 9 minutes. 8K fills the card in 6 minutes. Uh, now, the highest capacity CF Express B card I see is 650 gigs. Uh, that's probably 30 minutes. One of my observations is that the estimated time is very conservative. When you reach the end of the estimated time, the camera stops recording, even if there's space left, which there generally is. In my test scene, admittedly with little movement, I recorded 4K HQ using ProRes HQ. 16 minutes of record time is available. And yes, after recording for 16 minutes, the H2 decided that it should stop. However, there's still 3 minutes and 40 seconds left. So if the recording data rate is dynamic, potentially using less space than estimated, I would ask the engineers to please adjust the remaining time display in real time. Let's talk quality. First, comparing 4K to 4K HQ, both recorded with ProRes 422. Actual data rate is identical, 609 megabits. 
The difference is that the HQ version samples twice as many lines, but vertical resolution is the same. So let's look a little closer at the branches waving in the wind, the masts and the waves in the water. In HQ, the branches, the masts, the waves, and to me, the difference is visible. There's more detail. The HQ version looks crisper. But apparently that comes at the cost of sensor write speed. Uh, Fujifilm told me that the rolling shutter effect would be more visible with HQ. Let's freeze frame a cyclist. This is 4K. The wheels are round, but there's some bending in the spokes. And this is HQ. Well, again, some bending in the spokes, but no worse than the non-HQ version. More rolling shutter tests later. Okay, codex. Using the 4K HQ setting. Uh, starting with the H.264 All Intra. The actual data rate for this scene is 350, pretty close to the 360 I selected in the menu. Now, you're probably thinking that if this is near the low end of the X-H2 settings, it's already better than average. So, let's go up to the H.265 All Intra Codec at 420. The actual data rate here is 500. That's quite a bit less than the 720 I set. The improvement, if you notice any, is not dramatic. The H.265 All Intra 422, with a slight increase in data rate to 525. I'm not really seeing a difference between 420 and this one, but I thought it might make a difference for color correction, so I bumped up the saturation. And then, uh, side by side, the lighthouse red and the sky blue are somewhat less artificial, along with a slight increase in dynamic range. Using the ProRes LT profile, the measured data rate for the scene is slightly lower at 415. For the ProRes 422, the actual data rate is 610. For ProRes HQ, the data rate clocks at 900 megabits per second. So, I don't dispute for a second the value of using ProRes or the value of a higher data rate, but after studying them on my 5K IMAX screen, I barely see a difference between H.264 at 350 megabits and ProRes HQ at 900. And if there is a difference, it's likely even less visible at your end of the YouTube stream. I'm going to use ProRes 422 profile settings. And although you might be satisfied with even less, you don't need the XH2 for that. So all of those with the Eterna Film Sim, let's stay with 4K HQ ProRes 422 and go to F-Log with its minimum ISO of 500. Waveform with Eterna range from 0 to about 85 units. F-Log compresses that to 20 to 75. In editing, you'll make the adjustments to create the dynamic range you want. For F-Log 2, with a minimum ISO of 1000, the waveform is compressed further, 20 to 60 units, and that leaves a lot of headroom for brighter objects than those in this scene. <laughs> Again, you'll make the color grading adjustments in post-production. Although ISO 1000 seems high, remember that the darkest shadow is recorded at 20 units. When you pull that down to zero, there's very little visible noise. However, I wouldn't use F-Log2 unless the dynamic range of the original scene requires it, or if there is significant color grading to be done. And in that case, I would certainly record using ProRes HQ for the maximum data. Last two quality settings, higher resolution. This is 6.2K, downsampled in Final Cut to 4K, and this is ProRes 422, with the actual data rate of 1.6 gigabits per second. I can crop into the 4K center of the image, giving you an idea of how much cropping you could do with no loss of quality in a 4K production. And then 8K, an actual data rate of 2.4 gigabits, offering an even greater ability to crop without loss of quality. So just before you tire of the Humber Bay Lighthouse, let me take the camera off the tripod with all stabilization off, and that's your reference for my handheld shot. 
Now, I'm turning the camera's in-body and optical stabilization on. Not sure what I did to disable the digital assist here. The image is fairly steady. Add the stabilization boost, and the image is nearly as steady as a tripod. Now, back on the tripod, I tried a slow pan, which does occasionally have a small jump. And finally, let's torture test the rolling shutter. These are all ProRes 422 30 frames. Starting with HD 1080, there's a bit of a shear. 4K, about the same. 4K HQ, as promised, slightly worse, not by much. At 6.2K, the tilt is more pronounced, and at 8K, an even larger lean. My overall analysis, this is average to slightly better than the competition. And one final video thought. Yeah, the high quality settings I've just discussed will create large files, eating up lots of card space. So what setting will I use when I upgrade to the X-H2? <laughs> Most likely 4K HQ with ProRes 422. But consider that the video you're watching is 4K 10-bit 422 H.265 recording at 140 megabits. So, on the X-H2, using 4K HQ and selecting the H.265 Long Gop 422 setting at 200 megabits, that will record over 80 minutes on my 120 gig card. The X-H2's pixel shift mode combines multiple exposures to create a very high resolution image, 160 megapixels. Of course, there can't be any movement in the camera or the scene. On a tripod, I use the two-second timer to reduce movement, and the camera captures 20 RAW files. Now, I downloaded and installed Fujifilm's free Pixel Shift Combiner, use Register to find one of the files from the set, then Run to combine the files. It takes about a minute. The app also supports tethered shooting using a USB-C connection to your computer. Click Shoot, and then the files are combined. That simplifies the process, although it doesn't make it any faster. The 40 megapixel fine JPEG version of this image is slightly under 20 megabytes. The pixel shift combined file, its output as DNG, is over 570. Let me zoom in one to one so that there's one pixel of the standard file for each pixel in this 4K video. Let me do the same thing with the pixel shift version. Now, you can see all the detail in this file that's about 15,000 by 10,000 pixels. There is one more performance issue, but it relates to the rest of your workflow. Your memory cards, SD or CF Express, your computer, your display, your storage will also need to be able to handle the demands of these large, high-quality image and video files. Consider those as part of your purchase decision. Now, I'm sure that doesn't answer all of your questions, so please do post your civil comments and relevant questions in the comments. I do read and reply to all. So, in the meantime, this camera has to go back to Fujifilm Canada for the next reviewer. And although the camera's on loan, Fujifilm did not pay me. They did not read the script or review the video before posting. My sponsors are viewers who've joined this channel as members, and they enable me to refuse sponsorships from companies who'd like me to read their ads to you, and also to turn off YouTube's ad interruptions in the middle of a video. And while I do appreciate the support my members provide, I'm also thankful to my subscribers. Links below. Uh, thanks for finding the time to watch today. Stay safe.